Paul Reiser. Pleasure that was to be in a film with you. Uh, did you enjoy working with Paul? Well, I mean, uh... I wouldn't want to go so far as to say that we, we got along in any way. I was just kind of being television polite and said, oh, she's great. I said nice things about I don't her. think it's nice to mislead the American people in that way, Paul. The second part of the Alien Saga, directed by James Cameron, has today become a cult film for science fiction movie lovers. The return of its powerful protagonist, again accompanied by an excellent cast of actors, makes this film a true classic of the 80s. In this documentary, we will explore the history of the film in the voice of its protagonists. Together, we will discover why this sequel is one of the best sequels of all time. You know, the man who created Terminator has done what I thought was impossible. He has created a sequel which is better than the classic original. Yes, there was The Godfather, but with Aliens, James Cameron has created the scariest movie of this and maybe any year. Warrant Officer Ripley has remained in suspended animation for 57 years as her rescue ship passed unnoticed through the solar system, only to be saved by a salvage ship. Bernie Weaver made her movie debut in the movie Alien. That was 1979, and now seven years later, she is starring in the movie Aliens, plural. There is a connection, obviously. Sigourney Weaver with us this morning. Good morning. Hi, nice good morning. To see you. Nice to see you. What was this like to get to have to go back many years later and insert yourself back into this kind of weird, strange circumstance, or is it when you're actually doing it? It was almost as if, uh, as for the character... We have just lost our life. I hope it's not an alien. <laughs> yeah, they've cut the power. <laughs> um, it's okay. We're going to give it our best shot. Uh, that's why I like live TV. Um, Sigourney was critical. Uh -huh. Without Sigourney, as far as Jim and I were concerned, this script should not have been made. Mm -hmm. And we were quite firm in that stance. And I think that the audience would have felt the same way. To have someone else step into the to the to Ripley's shoes would not have worked. Mm -hmm. Well, I really, uh, I was very busy at the time this whole thing came up, and I was astonished to read the script and see that I, I was on practically every page, and no one had even called me on the phone to warn me. Um, but I, I really liked Jim, and I really liked Gail Hurd, the producer, and I was, uh, I didn't want to just make a movie that would cash in on the success of the first one. We all felt that it was very important to make a film that stood on its own. Well, I think that, that for all the negatives involved in making a sequel, uh, you have positives, and one of the positives is if you can take that, that initial programming that the audience has from the other film and then do a little twists and turns on it and, and like you said, play against their expectation of what's going to happen. They, if it's done in, in, a, in a not hostile way to the audience, then they realize that there's a little bit of fun involved and uh, that sh the film is having a little bit of fun with them, but but it, it makes them participants. It, it shows that, the, that the, the filmmakers assume a certain knowledge on their part. What I try to do in, w within Aliens, with, with the various scenes that you mentioned, is make, them the, make the scenes so that they functioned 
if you had never seen the first film. They didn't seem like something coming out of nowhere if you didn't if you hadn't seen the first movie. But so that they had a second level resonance for the people that had had seen the first film. Mm -hmm. it, I think it makes the it goes back to that idea of of the of the film being more of a participation experience as opposed to a passive experience. And that's that's uh, one of the great advantages of, of doing a sequel, if you can if you can pull it off. Alien was a suspense movie, and it was to me it was like walking down a dark alley, slowly knowing something something's out there, and at any minute it could jump out at you. Where Aliens is uh, much more of an action movie than a suspense movie, and it's. It's it's more like the the scares and thrills that you get from a roller coaster ride. It's exciting and, and scary as compared to being like uh, visceral and, and scary like the first one was. This movie stands alone, however, as a self-contained story, and in some ways it's probably better than the original. It has wall-to-wall -wall action and a lot more scenes involving those unspeakably horrible aliens with all their rows of sharp little teeth and their habit of using human beings as incubators. The movie stars Sigourney Weaver as the only survivor of the original expedition which discovered those aliens, and now she's joined another expedition which is returning to the planet where they were found. When she gets back to Earth, she and her story is met with doubt. After all, the companies had colonists on the alien planet for years. Kane, who went into that ship, said he saw thousands of eggs there. Thousands. Thank you. That will be Damn all. Damn it, that's not all. The terror that she's experienced has left a deep emotional scar on Ripley, causing terrible nightmares. Okay. And when Just contact is lost with the colony, Ripley reluctantly to agrees to go back, if for nothing more than to confront and hopefully end her nightmares. But to wipe them out. That's the plan. All right, I'm in. You have my word on it. You uh, may have seen our next guest playing a yuppie weasel in the motion picture Aliens. He is a uh, terrific actor and a comedian and also soon can be seen in the upcoming Beverly Hills Cop 2. Please welcome Paul Reiser. Paul. Thanks for being here. A yuppie weasel. That's what well, I had that's, in mind the whole time. Person. Well, did, did, you, were, you were a weasel. Not in the biological sense. That sense. That's not like no. an animated picture. No, now. no, the yuppie no, weasel. no. I didn't mean in the biological sense. I meant in the... Uh, a behavioral sense. Oh well, yeah, yeah. You you, you were uh, 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 devious, two faced. All right, I was. Yeah. Take me to prison. No, it's just a movie part. That's what see. I'm saying. Yeah. Uh, and you're also is this true? Beverly see, Hills now, Cop two. Now this is upsetting to me. I'm uh, Beverly Hills Cop two. I thought you come on the show. You know, I'll say I'm in a movie. People be impressed. Oh, he's in Beverly Hills Cop two. So then I come on and you're you know spending a half an hour with Eddie Murphy. So mm -hmm. now. How impressed could they be with me? You know, this is my whole point. <laughs> you know, I just said it's upsetting. And I'll be honest with you, Eddie's part, a lot bigger than mine. I'll uh -huh. be honest with you. What do you play in the movie? I play a yuppie weasel. <laughs> he never said anything about an android being on board. Why not? It never, never occurred to me. It's common practice. We always have a synthetic on board. I prefer the term artificial person myself. I'm sorry. I don't know why I didn't even... Ripley's last trip out, the, the artificial person malfunctioned. Malfunctioned? There were problems and uh, a few deaths were involved. The main thing is Burke does not start out as a villain. He's a regular corporation guy who has a job to be done. As time goes on and pressure gets w greater, his values go out the window. And he does some less than wonderful things. And uh, so I was not playing it as a villain. And, and uh, I was playing it as a regular guy who just does a terrible thing. I think part of being a comic or, or not being conspicuously villainous or evil looking works to, to surprise the audience. They go, oh, this is the guy we like. I'm shocked. Was it an older model? Yeah, the Hyperdyne system's 128.2. Well, that explains it, and the A2s always were a bit twitchy. The android turns out to be more human than the humans, kind of like Mr. Spock on Star Trek. She is set off with a group of Marines. We were all having dinner, and, um... It must have laid something inside his throat, some sort of embryo. He started, um, he... Look, man, I only need to know one thing, where they are. No, that's good. It was one of those crazy coincidences, but it was, you know, working out in a gym, women didn't do that in the 80s at all. And bodybuilding was like way on the, on the fringes. 
And I lived near a boxing and bodybuilding gym in East London. So I, and I loved lifting weights when I was a kid. I used to, you know, I was a tomboy. And so I, I went there. It was a nice, cheap gym. And it sort of coalesced that after two years of training, I was in the best shape of my life for bodybuilding, you know, bodybuilding. And, um, and then uh, this role came where they needed a, a woman who had, was very muscular. So, Hey, I'm impressed. Give me this. Hey, Vasquez. Have you ever been mistaken for a man? No. Have you? <laughs> oh, Vasquez. Well, the acid bath was great because that was the first shot of the film. And it was my introduction to action filmmaking. I mean, talk about being thrown into the deep end. I mean, four hour makeup and then being, you know, have, have chemicals put all over you that bubbled and fizzed and it was, it was pretty amazing. For me, uh, for me it, was, it, was, uh, it was interesting because I, uh, I don't often get a, a lot of uh, film offers at the same time, but I had got offered a full metal jacket at the same time as Aliens. And they overlapped one week and I had to make a choice. And Cameron had just done Terminator, and so he was known, but he wasn't like Stanley Kubrick at the time. <laughs> and every actor wants to work with Stanley Kubrick, so I, I, I had a hard time with that one. And, uh, and Cameron said, listen, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll let you come a week late to our shoot if Kubrick will release you. And I brought that back to Stanley Kubrick, and he said, nah, I can't release you, I can't release you. I said, well, can I at least read the script? Because wouldn't they wouldn't let nobody read the script. <laughs> And he says, nah, the script isn't finished, so I can't let you read the script either. So I had to make a decision, and I, and I chose Alien, and um, you know, the rest was history. So it was a, it was a, a, a pivotal point in my career, and I, I think I, I made the right choice, and, uh, and I'm glad I did it. Check it out. I am the ultimate badass. Yes. I almost signed to do a police academy, too. Jim was already in uh, England in heavy prep for the film. Now, I had been visiting, and, I, and, and the night before, I, I didn't have much money then, and so I couldn't really hire a car to take me out to Pinewood Studios, which is a good 45 minutes out of London. So I got on the train, went into central London, took the train out of London, got to Uxbridge, or wherever the hell it was, then I got on a bus that took me within about a mile of the studio. But then now I'm walking. I'm walking. It's you know, it's summer day in, in, in England, and I'm walking, I'm walking, I'm walking. It takes me like about 40 minutes to walk, and now I walk through the gates of Pinewood Studios. I mean, how many actors come out there to audition <laughs> will actually walk through the gates? But there I was. So Jim hands me like this cardboard tube, you know, poster tube, and says, okay, that's your plasma pulse rifle. And, you know, I'm just, I'm just going to be videoing this. And so, you know, I'm jumping up on the couch. We're doing all this stuff. He says, you know, loosen it up. Let's try this. He goes, come on, really give it to me. And I'm, I'm doing all this stuff. And I, I, I left the audition thing. Good Lord. I was so over the top, you know, just screaming every line. And, and uh, so I leave. And, God, for the rest of my vacation there, I'm kind of sweating it out. I don't hear anything. I go back. I come back to California. I don't hear anything for a month. And now Weird Science has come out, and I'm getting these notices, and I get a call from Hildy Gottlieb, my agent at ICM, and she says, uh, they're interested in you for Police Academy too." And the money is more money than I've ever seen in my life. And I'm thinking, well, gosh, yeah, okay. Because I, I'd kind of given up on, on getting cast by Jim and Aliens. So um, all of a sudden, Hildy calls me about a week later, and she says, what do you call a ball that comes out of left field? Yeah. Jim Cameron's going to call you in five minutes from England. The phone rings. I pick it up. It's Jim. He says, I, I, "Bill, I, I want you. I want. I want to cast you in the part of Hudson." And I was. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. Freezing. What do you want me to do? Fetch your slippers for you? Gee, would you, sir? I'd like that. Look into my eye. Okay. Well, <laughs> I was doing a film with um, Dennis Hopper uh, called The American Way. Funny story. I know how to make money. Uh, the, the, uh, 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 the film that I was doing, I went in the office to, to, to meet the director. So he said to me, um, would, you, would, you, uh, would you mind uh, shaving your head? I said, I don't know. Um, I have to phone my office. I, I called my office. and I was with international artists then. And uh, I phoned my office and said, they want me to shave my head. How much is that? Well, she said, that's a thousand a week more. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. 
Okay. So I said, yes, I went back and seen it. I'd be happy to shave my head. So I went up to see James Cameron for Aliens, and uh, he, uh, <laughs> he said to me, Al, uh, would you mind growing your hair? I said, oh, man. <laughs> James, I don't know about that. I said, oh, excuse me, let me call my office. <laughs> so, so I, I phoned my office. I said, uh, he wants me to grow hair. She said, I said, uh, she said, yeah, well, what's the matter? I said, well, how much is that worth? She said, oh, that'll be another thousand. <laughs> Al Matthews was a former sergeant. He might have been in Vietnam. I can't remember. He was, he was. an army sergeant. And we had a, a British member of the cast who never had any lines because he didn't sound right. But he was an SAS guy from the British Army, like highly trained. And they, they schooled us. They gave us, we had weapons training in all the weapons. We had to show, shoot pistols, um, flamethrowers, and I think pulse rifles, right? And, and I also think that because we're able to have this, this time together as, as a real unit, that by the time we actually started filming the movie, it did feel more like a unit. You know, you did feel like you knew these people. You also felt like you knew what you were doing. You weren't just getting up there and, and, and acting, so to speak. Um, I think that helped, helped throughout the film. This happens to involve a strong military aspect with a lot of military characters, so their weaponry has to look believable. We see several situations in which they live or die <clears throat> by their knowledge and use of, of their tools, the tools of their trade. We have to see that they understand how to use them, that they look like they've been using them for, for their, most of their professional lives, so to speak. It, it, I think it, it goes back more to reality. And um, if, you can, if you can give an actor a, a weapon that has certain weight, has certain functions, and that they can be taught how to use it, they can create their character if they're playing a soldier. You got uh, 15 of these M40 grenades. Don't touch that. It's dangerous, honey. How long after we're declared overdue can we expect a rescue? 17 days. 17 days? Those things are going to come in here just like they did before, and they're going to come in here, and they're going to come in here, and they're going to get us! In. This little girl survived longer than that with no weapons and no training. Uh, there was a much more of an emotional through line for me through this picture, and uh, uh, in the clip I'm going to try to rescue a little girl, uh, played by Carrie Hen, uh, who will be on the show tomorrow. Um, and uh, so that there were, there just was a, a different set of circumstances for me. And since I am older and more experienced, I like that increased mm -hmm. responsibility. Um, you know, to be honest with you, they were all fantastic. They would come and, you know, sit with me at my table and play with the clay and do different things and color with me or do whatever, and just treated me like one of them. And, at, before shooting started, they actually made them run around Pima Studios with their guns under their arm and actually train like they were in the Marines. And they used to let me run along with them and I'd have my doll, my Cabbage Patch Kid underneath my arm running with them and everything. So I never felt like I would, didn't belong with them. It was really nice. Carrie's a very, very adult nine-year-old. She had no problems at all with, with any of the things that we did on the film. Um, in fact, before Mrs. Hen allowed her to take on the role, she showed her alien, which is a pretty terrifying piece of filmmaking. She'd never worked in a movie before, and uh, she, you know, she was always there, and it was kind of funny, because when she first started off, it was all sort of, I could tell she was sort of in awe of it all and didn't really know what was going on, and towards the end of the shoot, it was like, you know, Bane, you're not on your mark, you know? <laughs> so she got a little worldly. We didn't get a chance, obviously, to work very much together. Right. But uh, my favorite moment that I had with her... Was it the ducks? Yeah. No, oh. no, no, no. Um, was that we were all standing around looking at a map, okay. right? right? And she was down below, like, running around, like, oh. trying to get a whatever. And I said to Jim, Jim, can I, can I pick her up and like, set her on the table and, and so she can see what's going on? And Jim said, yeah, I think that's a really good idea. And it you know, kind of softens Hicks and, 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 and uh, it was the one little moment that I that had, had with yeah. you, you know, and it was, it, it, and it's... And I also, I think the main thing for me was that my character, who was um, sort of an eager beaver in the first one, 
had been burned out and had really become an outcast at the beginning of this and uh, is a very reluctant leader and a reluctant heroine. And it's not till she meets that little girl that she rekindles her will to survive. I My mommy always said there were no monsters, no real ones, but there are. You know, the scene where, uh, where Newt is submerged in water and you just know that somewhere in that murky water is one of these aliens. You just go, don't do this to the kid. No, he's going to get the kid. I don't know, because to me, it's very normal. Like, I, to me, everybody's in a been in a movie, you know. I don't know what it's like to never have been in one. Um, but I wasn't scared um, of every anything because when we were filming, James Cameron, uh, everyone just made sure that I knew exactly what was going on, exactly what they were doing, exactly how everything worked. And so, you know, like the aliens running around after me, two minutes before we started shooting, they'd be standing there with the head off talking to me because they were my friends. So it wasn't really scary to me. For me, it was really very, very easy because I like the little girl and she's really, she's really like, Elle est très mature, je pense. Elle est très comme ça. Euh, ce n'est pas comme un enfant qui. Est, elle est comme un petit soldat dans le film, et elle m'aide beaucoup et elle m'encourage. Elle dit, elle me, elle me dit toujours Ripley, jamais Sigourney. Elle dit très bien Sigourney, c'est très très bon. Um, I had worked for Roger Corman and we did a film called Galaxy of Terror, which was Roger's definitive pay on to be charitable <laughs> to uh, uh, Alien. And um, I was working as a designer and an effects man. And uh, that's what attracted me to the project, the opportunity to create another world. Do you have to be pretty careful about security? I mean, close nothing. But what close? So we got half as much as I wanted and twice as much as we need, like most days. Well, maybe Ray would argue with that. We're looking at some material that I shot in a previous life three weeks ago. I dimly remember doing. It's um, part of the airlock sequence, the, the finale of the, of the film with uh, Sigourney Weaver dangling for her life, basically. You'll have to see the movie if you want to see more and find out more about it. Reading the script, it was one of the best scripts I had ever read. And just on paper, it was horrifying. I, I, I would have to read four or five pages and take a walk around the block and calm down. It was just really intense. You and Jim have formed your own production company now. What kind of projects are you looking for? I, I, I hear time and time again, uh, any good script that comes along, we're interested in. But is there, is there a particular kind of genre or, or area that, that you're more interested in? Well, Jim and I work together, and I also work separately from Jim. The, the projects that Jim and I want to concentrate on as a team will, almost without question, uh, evolve from ideas that Jim or I have. And Jim, and I will either write them together or Jim will write them himself while I'm perhaps producing another project. And in that sense, I, I think that, um, that we can... We can bring our visions to the screen and, and not have to rely on that rare good script. I think Jim's a brilliant writer. I really do. I think, I think he's very good at evoking well-rounded, meaty characters and creating the situations out of those characters and propelling the storyline almost relentlessly from beginning to end. Yeah. I think it's a, it's a great, great action movie with uh, good special effects, a very strong story, uh, and it's not very often that you get action movies that have a real strong story. This is a very violent film, mm -hmm. and uh, many people say that, uh, that this character out-Rambo's Rambo and out-Commando's mm -hmm. out, uh, Commando. It's always been my goal, you know. <laughs> to be identified with. Well, Sigourney herself as a person doesn't like guns, and I, I understand that, and I, I respect that. 
I, I would make a lot of jokes about myself being Rambo Lena with all these guns, which I, I really detest guns, and I thought, how am I in this movie? You guns. know, and I sort of read the script without even noticing the guns. <laughs> uh. The reason that, that she didn't have uh, a problem with it as, as an actor in this film is because she wasn't shooting at people. I think it would be very hard for her to do a scene where... Um, uh, she was, uh, uh, you know, in a in a combat situation with uh, with other other people. Um, I think would, I'm so glad that they were monsters and not people, because I think that would have been much much harder. Uh, but here she's fighting this this elemental alien force, these these things basically, and the, it it doesn't have the same moral connotation. I don't think, even though the imagery is the same. There she is with the machine gun. I was quite uncomfortable with it, although ultimately I feel the film uh, doesn't glorify the weapons. They're basically saying these people who are so macho about their weapons are wrong, that, that, you, know, that you can't depend on them, and that, that, it's sort of an, that heroism has nothing to do with how, how big your machine gun is. Um, and uh, I feel that my character is, uh, only takes up a gun when there's really no other way, and, and certainly doesn't... I have to become like a samurai in order to get back uh, Newt, but I certainly don't feel that I'm on a vendetta, and it's not till that egg opens in the throne room that I start to wreak havoc. In other words, Jim would say to me, well, you really hate these aliens, and i go, no, I don't, and he'd say, well, sure you do. I mean, look what they did to your crew on the first ship. I said, I know that it's natural for us to be enemies, but it's not personal to me. In other words, I don't hate them. You know, I just feel, unfortunately, I keep ending up in a position where I have to battle with them. On the other hand, uh, as I say, I think you get to see that Marines, the Marines, the tough Marines are real heroes and that uh, what, what counts uh, when things are going so much against you is your character more than anything else. Roll camera. You ready, David? And action, Nigel. Cut. We might have a uh, second camera position, depending on... A lot of directors who aren't artists or designers themselves have to say, do three, and I'll pick one. I say, do this, and, I'll, and, and that's it. <laughs> I think there are... There are low-budget movies, there are high-budget movies, and then there are, there are no-waste movies. I like to, to uh, think of myself as a no-waste filmmaker. When, in fact, Jim Cameron decided to do Aliens, he wanted to do it without any stop-motion animation. He wanted to do it all live. The Queen Alien is a 14-foot puppet, and 14 operators, 14 puppeteers bring her to life. But she's a performance. She's a live-action performance. Um, I think the most amazing thing I saw was when the Queen Alien was introduced. I was on set that day and there were literally 18 guys with pulleys. I mean, it's a puppetry. I mean, she was a puppet. Massive puppet. But imagine they were manipulating her as if they were just like puppeteers. And to see that be created with a guy, you know, in the, oo the goo used to come out of her mouth. There was actually a guy in the helmet, the head... Pushing the goo, the goo guy, exactly. Ron Cobb, who of course is one of your principal designers on the film, said that in the early stages you were very consciously making a Vietnam War movie in outer space. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. As an element. Mm -hmm. But to me, the, the, whole, uh, the whole Vietnam uh, experience was almost science fictional in the sense that it was, it was the first real high-tech war um, that was waged against an extremely low-tech enemy and lost. Which to me is is a is a very is a very strange thing. It showed how technology didn't work, and there's an aspect of that in this film. It's like, why are we losing? And uh, uh, I remember distinctly, you know, going in a room with with um, uh, uh, Jim Cameron and having all the actors come in in costume, and uh, and we had felt tips and we were, we were putting. You know, little slogans on their body armor, right? You know, right, you know, they scribbling the apocalypse now, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and and I invented a a, a, a patch for the uh, dropship, which uh, they did it wrong and made it too small. But it was this, uh, the colonial eagles, you know, 
with these great big boots coming down like this with a machine gun pointing down and and uh, and and it says bugs uh, bug stompers <laughs> that's what they were and then uh, and the thing I was I was most pleased was I came up with this slogan that was around it says we endanger species <laughs> I love it. and I had a jacket with that on the back but I lost it oh but, we need to but, do that again that'll but, be that'll be a collector's item but my my point being here is that we knew uh, we knew that we were recreating uh, Vietnam, you know, in the way right. the military looked mm -hmm, and all mm -hmm. that. And I had to do the drop ship. Mm -hmm. You know, it was very clear to me right away that Jim wanted a kind of a kind of an Apache or a or a uh, you know some a Huey helicopter mm -hmm. as a, as a spaceship. And part of you would say, well, that. You won't even recognize air, air aircraft or spacecraft that far in the future, you know. But it'd be fun to try. Yeah. So, so uh, rather than endless variants on airplanes, you know, I'd like to see some spacecraft mm. designs that say, "Wow, that might work," or, mm. or, or, or "Well, that makes sense." So, you, I think the movie company is trying to keep the aliens a secret until you see the movie, or maybe job. they're afraid. But the aliens are such a turnoff that if you do see them, you won't go to the movie. Yeah, there, there was a lot of concern uh, in that regard. In fact, the studio was very, very uh, leery that we could uh, we could pull it off. And I I promised them on a you know, on a stack of Bibles, so to speak, that I would do it all with six suits, and we did. I mean, there are, there are only there are only six in one shot at one time. It's only editorially that you believe you're seeing uh, more than that. Uh, because they just keep coming at you from different <laughs> angles. It's the same six guys, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> I like to create things that you're not aware of the technique. It's a little bit more magical to me for me to have you accept a character that we create and walk out of the film going, it's real. Bruce and I did this in about eight seconds when we, when we were lining up this scene. It worked perfectly. I've got it on my video. Okay. Too bad I wasn't shooting 35 mil. Actually, the, the problem that you always find with, with storyboards is they're two-dimensional. And you have to... I seem to use extrapolate a lot, don't I? You have to extrapolate um, what is essentially a three-dimensional shot from single frames that never communicate the speed of the object or the type of move. And one thing you'll find in this film is that the camera moves a lot. Uh, there tends to be in, in perhaps other films, and perhaps it's, it's in some way related to the, the two-dimensional storyboards that, that the effects uh, are normally shot from, that the camera doesn't move. And you can always tell a, spe a special effects shot in some films because the camera stops. Tilt. Ooh, go away. I just took my little uh, uh, JVC uh, camcorder and, and uh, handheld went through the, the various movements of the special effects shots were, were to have. And we did that on weekends, even, even during the, uh, the normal shooting of the film. I'd get together with the effects guys and like stick, stick up the model and put a couple of lights on it and do a video board. And those served as the definitive reference for the actual timing of the shot, how fast it was, how big it, in frame, et cetera, et cetera, when I couldn't be around. So it was just a way of sort of doing the shot in advance and then letting them refine it on film. Well, some of, some of, the, of the, the hairier um, effects were done on location in a, um, an abandoned uh, power station. And it was made completely out of uh, steel and concrete, and we were able to, to go pretty much hog wild with the uh, with the pyrotechnics and also a lot of it was done in miniature and hopefully the, the blend off between the full size and the miniatures is smooth enough that you don't always know what you're seeing and to get his movie off to a magical start he's entrusted the opening shot to one of Hollywood's top specialty effects firms forward productions the home of two noted effects wizards brothers Dennis and Robert Skotak yeah, like these guys working on the railing here we want to reposition the camera and here in their Burbank, California studio, the Skotak brothers create action sequences so finely crafted and creatively photographed that audiences would hardly guess the scenes are actually happening in miniature. 
The SCOTAX work includes such memorable moments as the exploding atmosphere processor in Aliens. But the SCOTAX first achieved prominence by helping to revive an older, more traditional approach. This technique is known as in-camera because the complete effect is achieved by photographing all of the elements at one time using a single camera or by photographing multiple exposures on a single strip of film negative. We do a lot of things in camera so that we can show to the director, to the producer, whoever, the art director, what the final shot would look like much faster. And there's less ambiguity about it. I mean, it's all there, you can see it, and they really love it. And we do too, because it's very direct. You don't, you're not surprised later on. The Skotak's intimate knowledge of space films proved invaluable when they oversaw the visual effects for aliens. For one heart-stopping shot, Dennis and Robert used a combination of miniatures and rear screen projection to create the illusion of a shuttlecraft crashing on a distant planet. Among the difficulties you'll, you'll find in a setup like the dropship crash is how to give a sense of weight. What we did was dress the set with uh, ash and fuller's earth and various par particulate matter that would scatter instead of clouds of dust and send bits and pieces flying at the camera. Many of the film's action scenes were created in camera, including some using this radio-controlled armored personnel carrier. Our miniature, which was uh, roughly five feet long, the only way we could get to go fast enough was to actually build the set as a downhill slope. So the cameraman was ahead of it as it was going down the hill, and it was coming at him, and he was rolling backwards with gravity on a dolly, and the thing was coming right at him, we're frustrated in that ultimately these, these images are not three-dimensional. We try to break through that barrier to give the sense that the stuff is coming off the screen. And also what I tried to do was, was uh, uh, make the aliens interesting from a, from a dynamic standpoint and the way they moved. We, were, we did a lot of experimentation with different ways of, of, uh, of moving them, you know, hanging them on wires and shooting them at different speeds and turning sets upside down and sideways and, and, you know, turning the camera upside down and just every trick in the book to give them this weird sort of dynamic, uh, un un unhuman type of motion. Well, what, once again, we, uh, you know, we, I went more for motion as opposed to design because I, I thought that, that quick blurring lizard-like or insect-like leap was more important than than the physical sculptural design of the suit. And I think that's a mistake that a lot of makeup and prosthetics people make when they're, when they're dealing with this sort of thing, is that they, they, they lavish all their attention on the sculptural detail, the surface texture, et cetera, of the suit. And they fail to realize that people need very few pixels of information to identify a human figure. And most of that identification is through motion, you know, the way we walk. The way we walk is so ingrained in us mentally that you can see it just like that. So it was, what we did was we actually um, redesigned the suit and made it simpler and less sophisticated and basically uh, freed it so that, uh, so that it, it was much more flexible. And then um, we found people to, to be inside the suits who were gymnasts and acrobats and that sort of thing. And then we hung them on wires and had them act like lizards. <laughs> you know, I mean, it was... It was um, it was a you know a study in a study in motion mm -hmm. and and in human motion, but also there's another form beyond those those sort of smaller aliens which we called the warriors in the sense of like warrior ants. There's an, another form which is the you know the alien queen, right. which was a completely unhuman silhouette and unhuman geometry. It was definitively not a suit, and I think that and and that's what we show more clearly. But uh, certainly in the power loader, uh, I liked that scene. There was something very sort of mythic about it. Well, we, uh, the man who's, th there was a man standing inside it, uh, covered by sort of a seat cover. And we choreographed together uh, with Jim our moves. And basically you are, we had some hydraulics, but basically we were doing it. Mm -hmm. And um, it took, you know, it took some practice to get used to it. It is a sort of frightening thing because, first of all, I'm like in this iron cage. You know, it falls over. I'll just be like squashed <laughs> tuna fish <laughs> or something. <laughs> the, the real reward for us is much less something like an Oscar, but it's seeing a great shot on the screen and, and knowing that it's going to be around for a number of years and a lot of people appreciate it.
Hello, Earthlings. I'm Leonard Nimoy. And I'm William Shatner, and we have materialized to the magic of special effects. They're so good at magic, I wish they could conjure up a couple of awards for us. Don't Let's get on with it. It's an important award. Visual effects. The nominees for visual effects are... Uh-huh. Aliens, Robert Skotak, Stan Winston, John Richardson, and Suzanne Benson. Robert Skotak, Susan, and Suzanne Benson for Aliens. We'd like to thank the members of the Motion Picture Academy, the Anglo-American team, because they did all the work. Thank you. Great recognition. Thank you. Thank you so much. So be a little further. You're supposed to have gotten out first. Not up. I think once you've once you've broken through the the uh, the threshold of doing effects and, and you've learned how to do most of the techniques, uh, you you reach a point where it's not quite as challenging as it was. Whereas working with with actors in dramatic situations are as uh, the challenges are as are as variegated as 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 dramatic situations can be. So there's always always something there. So I'd have to say I probably enjoyed working with the actors more. Yeah. In addition to that, I get very involved in, in the casting aspect of the film and work very closely with Jim on finding the people to bring the characters in the script to life. No, you, you know, you, you're one of these actors that I have seen for years, and I have to admit, I have to admit, at first I didn't know your name. I guess, what was the first big one? Was, it the, was Terminator the first big one? Terminator, yeah. Yeah, okay, because yep. you, you were the guy chasing, uh, chasing Arnold. Running away from him. Running away from him, right. yeah, I guess running away <laughs> the other way around. Right. And uh, we had a great group of people, a lot of very good young actors, and uh, for me it was one of the first times where I've been one of the more experienced actors on the set. All right, is it easier when, now, you know more. Mm hmm Does that make it easier to do a good job, or in some ways does it make it harder? Well, you demand more of yourself, or else there would be no point. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. this was a much more demanding role. I don't want to hear about it, Bishop. She's alive. There's still time. In 19 minutes, this area is going to be a cloud of vapor the size of Nebraska. Hicks, don't let them leave. We ain't going anywhere. When I work on these, a lot of people have asked me, do I feel bad about not being able to be the hero, not being able to be the one at the end who does everything, but um, it's okay. I mean, both characters that I played were strong male, you know, characters, and when I'm working on them as an actor, I never think, oh, well, I'm not going to be in the end of the movie, and this bums me out, or I don't feel good about that. Jim Cameron has given me the opportunity to be in two really, really tremendous movies and to not be around for the finale and be able to, uh, you know, finish off the monster or the monsters, and as the case is in this one, is a small price to pay for, you know, being able to be involved in such a great project. You also seem very loyal to people that have worked with you before. Uh, we see many of the same actors uh, appearing time and time again. Is, is there sort of a community uh, feeling, or is, it, or is it that you know their work and, and therefore you can trust them? I think it's a combination of those factors. Um, plus, we keep them in mind, of course, for whatever roles that, that, that might be suitable. Um, I think a repertory company is a good idea. It works in, in the theater, and I, I don't see why it shouldn't work in films. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. A lot of community theater when I was a child. Uh-huh. Did that help, or was it? I think it? so. <laughs> I think so. I think it gave me a confidence of knowing that I could do it uh, at a very young age. And it's, it's like playing sports or riding a bicycle. I think once you, once you do it, you know you can at least, you, at least you can do it well enough that you won't embarrass yourself. Mm -hmm. You have commenced, like most of the actors, by the theater. Yes. You have commenced very young. Ah, oh, mais uh, en école, ouais. <laughs> mais pas sérieusement. Uh, uh, pour moi, ça, ça vient très lentement, la décision d'être uh, dans le théâtre. J'avais voulu uh, être une journaliste ou une uh, 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 biologiste de la mer et toutes les autres choses. Et c'est à cause du uh, fait que je ne peux pas décider entre tous les choix que j'ai décidé. Si je suis acteur, je peux faire, uh, 
je peux avoir uh, plein de vie. Let's start somewhere else. Let's, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself. Where, where are you from originally? New York. Mm -hmm. New York. Grew up here. How old were you when you left? About 12. 12. And you uh, had a, a very colorful life, didn't you? A very colorful early life? <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> I, I left New York after I realized you had to pay uh, like a buck a piece for oranges, and I, 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 it's time to go somewhere else. Yeah. Did you get into trouble as a kid? A little bit. Where, where, where did you go when you left New York? Uh, I went west. You know, that was still a calling back in the 40s. Talking about New Jersey? Yeah. <laughs> what kind of trouble did you get into? Uh, um, well, I, I got picked up for vagrancy a lot because I hitchhiked across country. And you just, as you, uh, you're a kid and you're yeah. hitchhiking across the country. Yeah. And you got picked up for vagrancy. That means, of course, you have no no money, money at all on you. Yeah. I, a lot of things had to do with economics when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. We were we were broke. So, but anyhow, when I got to Tucson, they threw me in jail uh, for vagrancy, and Lee Marvin came into that jail to to play the life of Ira Hayes, mm -hmm. and I asked him to get me out, mm -hmm. but he wouldn't. Yeah. They just went on. <laughs> <laughs> oh darn! I thought maybe. But, uh, but that was the the first uh, my first connection to acting. Uh -huh. But you <laughs> is that the why is that funny? <laughs> were you? But you were also in a film uh, when you were behind bars, right? Yeah, they they paid me five bucks to be an extra. Uh -huh. So somewhere out there in, a, in an archive somewhere is me marching with fifty other guys in there for vagrancy. You know. So in the background is a shot of you actually in, in Act jail with other actual yeah. prisoners. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, you were uh, uh, sailed with a merchant marine? Yeah, I, I used that as a, a way of... I never knew my father very well, so mm -hmm. I, I got on ships to find out what kind of guy he was, and then I ended up in Europe. You, your father had been in uh, the merchant marine as well? Had His been whole a sailor? Life. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. And uh, what sort of things did you do when you were on ship? Well, I was like a floating bum, kind of. Yeah. Was, that's what it was like. Did, did you get paid to, to travel that way? Sixty bucks a month or yeah. something. Yeah. Uh, and it, a tough, difficult life to be on... Uh... Very easy. I mean, very boring. I mean, uh, just standing real watches and all that kind of thing. Uh -huh. But when I got to Europe, I traveled Europe painting murals. So it was, it was kind of... You're an artist as well, then. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I think in pictures, not in words, because I've been a painter my whole life, you know what I mean? It, I started acting because I wanted to live a thousand lifetimes. I don't want them to make my story and be an hour and a half. It's a good reason to become an actor. Aliens was my first film ever, so I was, you know, overwhelmed, I was scared, I was excited, so... Well, you know, I'm, I mean, I'm a character actress, I don't play myself. So I do research background, worked on accents for every character I play, whether they're a Latina or whether they're Irish or, you know, every uh, character is different, so... Mm -hmm. The character was from was from the barrio of, of Los Angeles, so yeah. And I grew up in Los Angeles, not in the barrio, but so I was very specific, you know, a chola from from, <laughs> from you know El Sereno, you know, Boyle Heights, no. But yeah. And the thing about aliens, which I like the best, I made up all my own lines. Oh, did you? Yeah, I don't follow scripts. That's not that's not the line. Yeah. It's, 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 well, what would you say? I said, what I'd say, they said, that's good, we'll yeah. use that. I think if you take it with a, you know, a grain of salt and not get too worried, well, the trouble with me in my situation right now is I've gotten to a certain level with Twister and Apollo, and now it's like, well, what are you going to do next? It better be the right thing, and that kind of stuff gets to be aggravating. I think you just need to have faith and keep doing what you do, and, and hopefully you get better at it. And. Uh, you'll get these opportunities. Uh, to me, it's, it's just as e easy to work, not just as easy, but it can be just as easy to work with, with nothing there and use your own imagination or, or with an alien there as it is to work with another actor. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't really <laughs> see the big difference Might be between. the same sometimes. <laughs> sometimes it's easier. <laughs> uh, uh, what, what is the film now? Do we, do we aliens. Know? Oh, Aliens. Uh, with a zzz. Outer yeah, space kind of deal? Remember Alien? It's the sequel to Alien from about seven years ago. Yeah. Ooh, scary. Yeah. I couldn't even... What, what part are you? I play Herschel the Waterboy. Uh -huh. No, I, um... <laughs> just, they're fighting, and I go, more water, and then I go away. Just a little thing of a fresco. Maybe should I bring them beverages? <laughs> um, I play the part of the guy. But it's so... There's a guy in it, and uh -huh. I play the guy. There's a lot of guys. A lot of guys. Is it, is it a, a sizable part? It's a sizable part. It's a size 34 regular. <laughs> it's a, uh... No, it's a good part. It's really nice, and it's a... Uh, so it'd be a big film. Big film. Yeah. Big film, July something it opens. All right, the theater's good. near seven out of ten people. We'll <laughs> we'll write that down on our things we'll to write do it down, list. Yeah, it. absolutely. Uh, nice to see you again, Paul. Thank Thanks you. for being here. We'll do a uh, commercial. And that sort of leads into my kind of.
two-sided review of this film. This is one of those on the one hand and on the other hand movies. On the one hand, it's very well made. Sigourney Weaver does a terrific, very strong acting job. She holds the movie together with a powerful performance. The special effects are outstanding. The movie is scary and horrifying and disgusting from one end to the other, and I have nothing but admiration for its craftsmanship. But on the other hand, and this is a big but, at the end of the movie, you know what? I felt really bad. My stomach was all knotted up, and I was jumping and unhappy and tense, and it took me a while to get back to normal again. Aliens was so strong, it was overkill. It really did upset me. This is pretty much wall to wall the monsters are on the attack and we we tried to, to make a film that was as good as the first film without being as gross as the first film and to do that we had to offer something in its place which was an excitement factor or a, or an exhilaration or something else some other emotion uh, and uh, I personally like action served up you know, nice and, and hard and lean and fast, and that's what that's what we tried to do. And I'd say the last last thirty minutes of the film uh, pretty much de delivers in that in that area. Yeah. Once so, they get once we see the first monster, from that point out, you got about an hour or more of monsters on right. attack. The thing that that amuses me is that people actually laugh during the film at the fact that they're being so manipulated. <laughs> And I have another objection. This is a one of long standing. I think one of the cheapest shots you can do in a movie is show a child in peril. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a kid in front of the street and will the car run him down. When I see a movie do that, that I, I check out of that picture because I think they're taking the easy way out. And I know that the kid, unless it's one of these comedy splatter films or something, uh, the kid is not going to get nailed. So it held no suspense for me. Is she yeah. a real little girl? Or does she have one of those things inside yeah. of her? And I was waiting for that bomb to go off. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say wouldn't. if it does go off yeah. or not, but it's... People have a lot of preconceived notions about this going into it, and they go, oh, I remember the first one, I'll bet you it's in the cat. But it seemed to me that they were yeah. using her yeah. innocence yeah. as well, maybe a thriller they, technique. Yeah. And all I'm telling you is I saw her in, in pain, and I was in pain. I, I am on... Your other okay, well then what about okay, but what about the other? What about Sigourney Weaver? Well, what about well, the let me craftsmanship? Tell you, I mean, this is, it's a, me, one of those yeah, movies that you have nice, to admire at some level. I'll admire it only at this level. Good art direction. Sigourney Weaver has to hold the movie uh, up alone, and she's not equal to it because there are so many monsters. Oh, I think she is equal to it. Well, I will give her that. Yeah. Coming I up will. next, we have a disagreement. Coming up next, two Chinese. summed up the business I'm in in a strange way so if you look you know if you look through a piece of film it's all distorted really if you're trying to see what's behind it and I think the business is a little like that A lot has been made on this film about uh, the shooting difficulties. It was a hard film to produce. Um, what did you do to uh, you know keep your sanity during the shooting, to relax? Um, 
I'm not sure if I had my sanity going for me at all times. Well, the first problem, I think, is, is one that a lot of producers of sequels have, especially if they didn't produce the first film, as I did not, um, in that there is a tendency to make the sequel a remake, to focus on the same elements and the same formula that made the first film work. Well, we were under very little external pressure to do anything specific, uh, oh. meaning that, that the, the, um, the studio and the executive producers who were involved in the first film they had uh, opinions and so on, but they, they never really pressured us to do anything. There was, an, intern there was an internal pressure to be uh, true to the first film. Yeah. Okay, stick it up there. Let's see what you got. Okay. All right, now pull it so it lands right on the lens when I say action. There we go, and action. Like a flying face hugger. Those are terribly convincing. Guys, guys, I want you to pull it so that it looks like it's leaping. It doesn't look like it's leaping. Don't you have gloves? You get some gloves. You can't pull hard without gloves. Get, get some gloves and call me when you're ready for this. A horrid experience for me is aliens. There's certain people that want to control the entire apparatus themselves. They don't know about the entire apparatus, and they are really very difficult to deal with. And Jim falls in that category. He would do it all if he, if he could, but he can't, and he knows he can't. But he is one of those people that is not very good at sharing. Uh, the most important lesson is that there is always a way to do it. Uh, somehow, some way, there's a way to do it. And the kind of projects that Jim Cameron is attracted to are these sort of high-tech visual psychodramas. Other directors, you know, would never do a film like that or aren't interested in that kind of a thing. Let me ask you something. When you do action films, things ever go wrong like tonight? <laughs> Does this ever happen on a movie, a, a big expensive film? Uh, I yeah. Yeah. We have, we've had some problems on shows before. Yeah. When I did the, uh, you were so friendly backstage, Alexis. <laughs> what was the question? I was asking you when you do the, when you do a big I, action film. I mean, yeah, I mean, we had some problems. And amazing stunts. I know you're in the. Believe it or not, I thought when I did the Terminator that I had had probably worked on the toughest film physically that I would mm -hmm. ever work on, and then Aliens comes along, and it was much tougher because of all the armor that we wear, and it is so heavy. It was very much a daunting process all the way through. Um, we had a release date that I wouldn't have dreamed of changing. A lot depends on how much time you have. Aliens was done in a week and a half. It was one of the things that I will... That's why I said I will never work with Jim Cameron again. Aliens was done in a week and a half, and it was a horrible experience. And when you're on the stage, the recording stage, in front of a large symphony orchestra as I was and he comes out and he's complaining that the cue between the three seconds that's between there and there doesn't work at all for him and you're saying listen you're lucky to have anything you know and here's a case where you do 85 minutes of music in a week and a half or something and you're just a wreck naturally and Jim doesn't have the sensibility to know what he's asked of you it's not worth it. There's a certain point at which you say, let me out of here. And whatever it takes to get out, as long as I'm not infringing legally on somebody else's territory, I just want to be done with the project. And suddenly, and Jim, you don't fool around with Jim because he, you know, time is money and this was his opportunity to make the film. And so you didn't fool around because he was um, seriously focused. But we had a little standoff, Jim and I, but um, we won't talk about that. It was fine. He backed down. It was cool. I think James Cameron, he produces amazing films. And I think part of what it is is he puts 110% into everything that he does. And that's what he expects. His expectations are high of his actors. Because if he puts that much in, he wants them to put that much work and effort into it. And that's what produces the amazing movies he's created. On Jim's set, it was all, it was all we went to war. I mean, it wasn't... There was no joking around on the set. There was joking around after work. You know, we're in London, for God's sake. We're all living in Chelsea, and they were 
they were shooting Full Metal Jacket in town at the same time, and all the characters in that movie, and all of us, we kind of would meet and have a slight party that evening, and it was a great time. It really was a great time to be had. And Aliens, and Aliens was no picnic either. I mean, Sigourney Weaver really, really went through a lot of hard, hard work, what you call kind of pick and shovel acting. Tough, small sets, cramped, smoke, fire, you know, all that sort of stuff. So you. And um, taped to it, I had a submachine gun, uh, which uh, would fire off about 17 rounds, and blanks would come out, which were like little casements. You had to actually be careful uh, that you wouldn't be hit by uh, other people's gun blanks coming out from the side. Um, they were always very hot. Uh, sometimes guns would, uh, sometimes the guns would lock, and uh, that's dangerous because then when you pass it, it can sometimes go off. I mean, basically, we treated them like real guns, and so no one got hurt. hurt. But uh, Pinewood, of course, was nervous about fire in general because they their uh, big bond stage, which is that was their pride and joy, burned down uh, a year or two ago. So I was a little worried about that when we went in there because I knew what we were going to be doing. Dans ce film, vous courez, vous battez. C'est un rôle parfois assez physique. Est-ce que vous avez pris des risques dans le tournage Vous êtes blessé ou pas Je suis. Il y a beaucoup de gens qui s'occupent d'être certains que tout est très bien fait. Mais j'ai appris comment utiliser les fusils avec le feu et le the machine gun and too, uh, come uh, Rambo. Uh, je je m'amuse beaucoup de 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 me dire Rambo Lina, et, uh, <laughs> comme ça. Jim Cameron was giving me orders, and Jim Cameron is in charge. After we finished up uh, a day shooting, we were filthy, filthy, and the armor was always pinching us, and there were little cuts and bruises, and it was so you get the showers after a day like that, and what you spend do? Spend another half an hour, you know, getting it all off, and go home and go to bed so you can be up at six o'clock the next morning. J'ai de respect pour Jim Cameron parce qu'il veut faire un film qui qu'on peut voir sans avoir avoir vu le premier, qui qui être uh, that can stand by itself. Est-ce que vous aviez plus de pouvoir que lui sur le film? Plus de, uh, la puissance? Oui. Non. <laughs> Jamais pour un acteur c'est dommage mais il était très ouvert à mes idées uh, il 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 m'écoute uh, tout le temps et souvent uh, nous 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 avons battu contre l'un et l'autre pour le pour le film pas contre uh, nous deux mais pour le film parce que uh, dans un film comme ça uh, um, avec tous les les effets spéciaux il faut que les acteurs uh, insiste que on doit avoir le temps de d'explorer les scènes de répéter. And these pulse rifles that we carry are so heavy, and when you do, we're crawling through elevator. I mean, uh, uh, air conditioning vents and and over this and under that. And you're in deep crouches a lot of the yeah, time. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. It was really tough, really tough. And if you do it once or twice, it's okay. But there are rehearsals and rehearsals, and then you do a take and another take and another take and. Uh, uh, so you end up doing these things uh, over and over and over and over again. I don't know how many of you saw the mission, but to me the score of the mission was a unique piece of music against the picture. I mean, it was a really beautiful marriage. It got nominated, rightly so. Got nominated the same year as Aliens got nominated, and I voted for the mission. Um, mm. Over and above my own score, partly was a reaction to Jim Cameron and all the things. <laughs> I thought the mission was truly the best score of the year. I wish I would have been given the opportunity to do that. But then again, I'm burdened by that I see it as an art form again, and not as just, gee, you know, screw it, it doesn't matter. As long as I get my paycheck, it doesn't matter. I can't do that emotionally. How are women going to take to this movie? 
Well, I, I've had people say, oh, you know, you play a woman, you carry these guns, and it's such a tough environment. Uh, will women like it? I think women will love this film because mm. the strongest characters in the film really are, are all female, including the little girl who is probably the toughest character of all. And there's a, a woman, Jeanette Goldstein, who plays Vasquez, who's the toughest Marine. I mean, she's mm. really uh, the most courageous soldier. Gail, it strikes me that maybe women in the motion picture industry involved in fantasy and science fiction films are not quite as prominent as many of the men are. True or false? I think, I think that's, that's not exactly true. Mm -hmm. Perhaps it's because of my orientation that I'm aware of it, but um, Raffaella de Laurentiis was the producer on Dune. Deborah Hill produced The Dead Zone. That's true. One of the Stephen King novels. Uh, Martha Schumacher produced another of Stephen King's screenplays, uh, Cat's Eye, and is currently the producer on Maximum Overdrive. Now, and for the record, your own involvement with James Cameron, Terminator and Aliens, is actually only part of the story. You've been involved in other fantasies as well. Right. When I, when I worked for Roger Corman, I, uh, I started out entirely on, on science fiction and horror films, which was his bread and butter. Voilà, voilà, ben Sigourney Weaver est arrivé. Je me fais tout mini, tout mini à côté d'une grande star comme ça. C'est la première fois qu'on reçoit quelqu'un dans le mini JT, dans votre mini journal. Vous avez un rôle très, très physique dans, dans Alien Le Retour. Il y a beaucoup de scènes de combat. Oui. Alors, je veux savoir comment ça s'est passé le tournage. Est-ce que c'était difficile pour vous Est-ce que vous avez suivi un entraînement Je ris beaucoup parce que je ne suis pas euh, comme un Rambo. Je suis vraiment très normal, euh, un peu faible et les armes sont très lourdes. Et je, je, euh, je make fun of myself. Vous vous amusiez Oui, je, je me parodie beaucoup <rire> dans le film parce que je ne suis pas un grand héros. Alors l'univers du film, l'univers de, de Alien, est un univers très masculin, très viril. Est-ce que ce personnage de Ripley, ça vous a pas fait un peu peur de perdre votre, per de, de perdre votre féminité en le jouant Est-ce que je perds quelques Est-ce que vous ne trouvez pas que c'était un personnage difficile à jouer dans un univers d'homme très viril euh, Mon personnage est vraiment une personne qui a des qualités de, de très calme. Et je pense que euh, c'est ce, euh, ces qualités qui euh, euh, l'a permis de, de, de euh, vanqu vanquish l'ennemi. Ce n'est pas vraiment parce qu'elle est une, euh, ma plus masculin ou féminin, c'est vraiment son personnage d'être très sûr. I think it's been rare. I think think women, not only in, in the genre, but in other genres, tend to be either girlfriends or victims and are ancillary to the male hero. And I, and I think, hopefully with Aliens, we're establishing a new trend towards strong women characters who are the focus of the action and the story itself. That's On true. That's true. And they're all uh, pretty, I mean, I would say women's roles are getting much more interesting now. I mean, I certainly hope that, uh, that the that the role of women in filmmaking in general is improved as a result of, uh, of the c continued uh, involvement of women. And in the meantime, you're helping to scare the hell out of us <laughs> in Aliens. And now, for best performance by an actress in a leading role, the nominees are... This is it! This is it! This is your award! You're all right, come on! I'm tired of running, tired of cowering! Now I'm going to stand my ground and fight! Sigourney Reaver in Poltergeist Aliens, Part 4. Um, I'm wondering if uh, Aliens 3 is in the typewriter. No, oh, not for me, it's not. Uh... Is there going to be a sequel, do you think? It's not up to me. I think, I think that, that hopefully that'll, that decision will be made if and when there's a terrific script that will take it into an even um, more unusual direction. Alors, qui pourrait vous remplacer pour ce rôle? Ah, personne. C'est impossible. <laughs> no. uh, I, I think one of the great strengths of Aliens is the scope and the variety of the characters. They're all so clearly drawn, and they're all a good mixture of... Um, it's a balanced. Uh, you relate to them on many different levels. 
Sigourney would always, there would always be some flowers in the dressing room uh, the, uh, the day of y your death scene. Of course, you know, like the first alien, the second alien does follow the, the whole Ten Little Indians thing as, as they get narrowed down. So yeah, Sigourney would give uh, flowers uh, <laughs> to the departing cast members. Let me, let me ask you, we, one, we have just a few seconds here left. You know, ever since we've been on the air, we've been trying to get you as a guest on this television program. And so tonight, because Mr. Big Shot is here, <laughs> you you just walk on in. But you now, why why can't you just come normally like a, a regular guest and, and one night be on the show? Yeah, well, I'm, no, I'm you, oh, I'm out of to say that. <laughs> I was hoping you. Would. Well, I I think it's because of the torrid off screen affair that Paul and I had that I that I. Now, is there something not. here? No, no, wait a minute. No, no, you don't talk about this. I'm I'm embarrassed. I'm sorry. No, no, but well, no, 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 what I thought this was but a you, show where but, anything goes. But you're you're kidding here. But are you really kidding? <laughs> um, I I just that's all I can say is that uh, if you like the Terminator, you'll like this movie. If you liked Alien, you'll like this movie. If you like both those movies, it's out of this world. I don't see any way this will not be a blockbuster hit. I mean, the word of mouth around here, I'm sure you're aware of, is just fantastic. Oh, good. So, that brings up Alien 3. Oh, well, <laughs> I think that's, uh, it took someone as uh, talented and crazy as Jim Cameron, I think, to come up with a story uh, that was as good as the first one. And I, I would be surprised if, if, if it could happen again. Um, and I have a feeling if it happened again that, that Newt would have grown up, the little girl, and that she would be the one to go off and carry the guns through space. Are you saying Sigourney would not do another one? I th well, again, I think they would have to twist my arm the next time. Um, but I, of course, I didn't think I'd do this one either, so uh, we'll see what happens. No breaks in this business. No. How do you, you have to? It? You have to, uh, you know, uh, prepare yourself so that you're ready, and then you have to fight for the, the opportunity to prove what you prepared yourself to do. I, you know, lies. I got my first directing opportunity on a film called Piranha 2, which turned out to be a complete disaster. I had huge creative problems with the producer. I was fired after two and a half weeks. I came back to Los Angeles with no money. My car had been repossessed, and I had absolutely sort of no no potential to move forward in the, in the business as a director at that point and I kind of grabbed myself by my bootstraps and said okay I'm not going to let that happen again the next picture that I do will be a script that I write and I actually became a writer to serve the end goal of becoming a filmmaker so I wrote the Terminator as a means to an end to get my next picture to direct you know that's a that was a tricky one you know a lot of people advised me not to make aliens which was called alien 2 you know when, when I first took the project on and aliens <laughs> and I said let's not call it alien 2 let's call it aliens yeah. 